uh, Barb Reich is University Professor at Brandeis and Maurice Hexter, Professor of Social and Economic Policy in Brandeis's Heller Graduate School. He's been in three national administrations, most recently, of course, as Secretary of Labor under President Clinton. He's the author of 10 books, uh, just a few of them. The Work of Nations has been translated into 21 languages and will soon appear in English, I understand. <laughs> Locked in the Cabinet was his uh, witty and revealing account of his experience in government. The Future of Success is his most recent book, or just about his most recent, almost his most recent book. And he has a lot to say about that, and as someone who's done it, I mean, he can speak about the future of success. He knows a lot about it. He has written extensively for The New Yorker, The Atlantic Monthly, The New York Times, many scholarly journals, and is a co-founder and national editor of The American Prospect. And in one of his most noteworthy recent uh, contributions to public service, he was defeated for governor of Massachusetts. Uh, Robert Reich was born in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and grew up in South Salem, New York, in a rural community. He graduated from Dartmouth in 68, obtained an MA at Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, and was a colleague of Bill Clinton's, I believe, at that time. Met his wife at Oxford as well. Then graduated from Yale Law School in 1973. For most of the last 20 years, except for his stints in Washington, he has been based in Cambridge, Massachusetts with his wife, Claire Dalton, who teaches law at Northeastern University and who was the founding director of Northeastern Center on Domestic Violence. They have two sons, Sam and Adam. Uh, he is an extraordinarily stimulating, lively intellect uh, who generates tremendous enthusiasm and public debate for his ideas. I had the pleasure of uh, teaching with him for several years in Cambridge, Mass, and uh, I learned a ton every single day. Uh, when he was Secretary of Labor throughout the first Clinton term, he managed a federal agency with more than 16,000 full-time employees, an annual budget greater than the Massachusetts state budget. He was able to downsize the agency by 12% through attrition, doing more with less. But he earned the Department of Labor, his leadership earned the Department of Labor more than 30 awards for innovation and government reinvention, a, a leadership program uh, sponsored by Vice, then Vice President Gore. A 1996 poll of cabinet experts conducted by Hearst newspapers rated Reich the most effective cabinet secretary during the Clinton first term. Rice transformed the Labor Department into a powerhouse of ideas, action, and innovation. Some of his accomplishments were the implementation of the Family and Medical Leave Act, fighting against sweatshops in the United States and illegal child labor around the world, increasing the minimum wage for the first time since 1989 that benefited tens of thousands of workers all across the country. His efforts protected workers' pensions by ensuring that companies fully fund their pension plans, and he launched numerous job training programs, one-stop career centers, school-to-work initiatives, all of which helped Americans earn higher incomes. Uh, you've heard him on Marketplace, on NPR. You see him on television. He had his own television show, I believe. I don't know if it was beyond Massachusetts. Was it nationwide or mostly in Massachusetts with Alan Simpson called The Long and Short of It, I think was right. Uh, this man checks all the boxes. Great scholar, brilliant writer, wonderful teacher, fantastic colleague, and uh, extraordinarily effective uh, public servant. This, everything I've told you, is true, but it's the cover story. It's the cover story. The actual story is something so bizarre, so literally incredible, that I believe without a photo, somewhat like Bush and the smoking gun photo for Iraq, you wouldn't believe me. So I'd like to pass out the photo, which documents what I'm about to tell you. Hold on to your hats. We're not going to discuss this probably tonight, but you know, in the current debate about Iraq, uh, the question is, will the administration be able to produce a photograph 
uh, a photograph that did for the UN debate this time what Adlai Stevenson's photograph of Cub missiles in Cuba did back in the early 60s. So we all know that a, f a picture is worth a thousand words. And I just think you, you just need to show this. Now, this is all highly sensitive information. You can't show this to anybody. Uh, the, the truth is that many, many years ago, Bob was basically sent here to achieve everything that I've just told you about. But he has this other affiliation. He is the ambassador to the United States of, shall we say, an unnamed, small, rather obscure, Central Eastern European, Central Asian, Middle East, African, <laughs> Persian Gulf country. And uh, occasionally has revealed his identity at key moments. I know this because for more than 20 years I have served as his interpreter. <laughs> and although Bob has changed little in the last 20 years, I have changed uh, dramatically. In fact, in this photograph that you have in front of you, I'm on the left and he's on the right. <laughs> I'd be delighted to tell you more about this, but I would be destroyed if I did. So with that as background, please welcome either this ambassador or Secretary Barbrush. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Mr. Dean, uh, this is a doctored photograph, actually. Uh, and uh, the person on the right is responsible for everything. I want to thank you all for coming. And uh, also, I am very flattered by having uh, two former chancellors here. Uh, and uh, let, me, let me just say, I, I, what I would like to talk about, I, I spent last year uh, running for office uh, in a very cold, dark state. Uh, called Massachusetts. It's not clear to me why anybody still lives in Massachusetts after spending a couple of days out here in California. But I'd be, but please do not, do not uh, tell people back in Massachusetts that I said that. Uh, because I still have a campaign debt and I'm still trying to go around the state, this lovely state, this wonderful state of Massachusetts. Um, I tried to get out here uh, a couple of days ago and uh, the plane I was on, just to give you some sense of, of the transaction costs that we go through in Massachusetts, the plane that I was on bound for San Francisco, in the seat right in front of me, somebody found a box cutter. <laughs> now, I was busy reading something, but I noticed out of the corner of my eye that there were a lot of police suddenly <laughs> running up and down the aisles. I kept on reading. I was engrossed in a wonderful public policy book. <laughs> Uh, but uh, but I, it, it took me forever to get out here. We had the delay in five hours, and we finally, uh, but I am delighted to be here. It was also zero degrees Fahrenheit. And that does not count the wind chill factor. There is nothing between Boston and the Arctic Circle. <laughs> the only people left in Massachusetts who haven't realized how beautiful it is in the rest of the country are losers. <laughs> That was my campaign platform. <laughs> I don't know why it didn't work. <laughs> what I thought I would, I would talk to you about, though, seriously, uh, is something that kept on coming up during the campaign, and I was kind of interested in, even before the campaign, because I've spent half of my adult life around politicians, working with politicians, advising politicians, criticizing politicians, being involved in campaigns, but never actually putting myself on the line as a candidate. Uh, now, I did not do this last year for a lark. I didn't do it for experience. I didn't do it for fodder for a new book. I did it because I genuinely thought I could do a good job as governor. But it did strike me during the course of the campaign, I did a couple of things that had repercussions that I should have expected, uh, but nevertheless was caught a little bit off guard about. Uh, for example, I was asked by somebody in the press, uh, long about last February or March, did I think 
that Cardinal Law should resign. Now you, some of you have been following what has happened in the Catholic Church and Bernard Cardinal Law's role in all of that. Uh, Massachusetts is a very much of a Catholic state. I am Jewish. Uh, I said in response to the reporter's question, yes. <laughs> My campaign manager could not believe I had done it. Uh, or to take another example, I was, I was asked during, very early in the campaign, uh, what I plan to do about a budget hole that was, you know, you here in California have a much bigger budget deficit, but in proportion to the total budget of Massachusetts, Massachusetts has a huge budget deficit. Uh, about 38 states have gigantic budget deficits. And I was asked a plain, simple, easy to answer question, which was, what are you going to do about the budget deficit in Massachusetts? And I said, well, it seems to me what we ought to do is raise capital gains taxes. My campaign manager could not believe. <laughs> or to take the third and last example, I was campaigning and, and we, there was a big parade, uh, a gay pride parade in Boston, and I as a candidate you know, was in the gay pride parade and I was giving a, a speech uh, to the assembled community, a gay community in Boston, in the Boston, uh, greater Boston area, and somebody asked me a question, the press was there, and the question was, do you and would you seek, do you believe in and would you seek legislation that would allow gay marriage? And I said, yes. <laughs> My campaign manager couldn't believe. <laughs> Uh, so the, the question, I, I, really the issue I want, to, I want to discuss with you is an issue, I talk about politics and principles, but it really goes back way before my campaign. It goes back to something I want to call the Dick Morris paradox. <laughs> you remember Dick Morris. Yes. You don't remember Dick Morris. <laughs> well, Dick Morris was... Uh, the reason I say that, Dick Morris was Bill Clinton's pollster. And he was brought into the White House in 19... There's some debate about exactly when he arrived, <laughs> because he arrived relatively surreptitiously. But he came in, we think, in 1995. Uh, and during the run-up to the 1996 election, Dick Morris and I would occasionally meet in the White House, in the hallways. Uh, he'd kind of slink around, skulk around. And I would enter into a debate with Dick Morris, which had various ways of... of, 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 of well, we, we debated essentially the following thing. I'm going to give you a stylized portrait of the debate I had with Dick Morris. It was an informal debate, but it was an ongoing debate through 1995 and leading up to the 1996 election. And I would say, Dick, if this election that we're about to have is about nothing, I mean, V-chips and school uniforms and little micro policies that the president could not actually get done anyway uh, that are really out of the realm of what a president ought to be saying. President ought to be, ought to be developing an agenda, I mean, for the second term, a mandate for doing things for the second term. If the president doesn't do that, if these are all little poll-driven, minor, inconsequential little things that will not ever be put into effect anyway, then why even bother getting reelected? What's the whole point, Dick? At which point, Dick Morris would say to me, Bob, if we did what you want him to do and say in these months leading up to the 1996 election, that I'm going to, I, Bill Clinton, am going to try again on universal affordable health care, and I am going to put more resources and money into education and job skills, and I am going to come up with campaign finance reform that really has teeth and all kinds of other things and that really are, are bold. If we try to do that, given the present atmosphere, given the fact the Republicans are in control of Congress, uh, we are not going to get reelected. And all of the ideas you think are very important, they may be bold, they may, but they are irrelevant. If you don't get reelected, what's the point? 
And I'd say back to him, but Dick, if you get elected without a mandate and without educating the public and without any idea of why you're getting elected and no principled basis for getting reelected, what's the point? <laughs> Needless to say, we never really came to a conclusion. But I call it the Dick Morris paradox, paradox for the very reason that there is something here about politics and principle. Dick Morris, he is not here to defend himself. And so I can say exactly what I want about him. <laughs> uh, he's very good at what he does. He's a very good pollster, and he does represent a kind of attitude toward politics, which is you go out and find exactly what the public wants you to say, uh, and you repeat to the public back what they want to hear. And if you do it right, and if you do it carefully, uh, the public will like what you say, because after all, you're simply mirroring back to them what they want to hear in the first place. And that is a way of getting elected. Uh, and Dick Morris was, was very good at his craft. Dick Morris did not believe, does not believe. And again, the purpose of my discussion with you is in no way to castigate uh, Dick Morris, but I'm using him as an example. Uh, Dick Morris does not believe in principles. That is, politics is a matter of getting elected. It's not a matter of having reasons for being elected. It's not a matter of having ideas or ideals. It's a matter of getting elected. Dick Morris is a political consultant and pollster, and he represents, he's one of the best, but he represents an entire way of viewing politics that is now very prevalent in Washington. There are many of these pollsters and political consultants, and they glom onto a candidate like barnacles. And I was lucky enough in my little campaign in Massachusetts, uh, I didn't have very much money, I couldn't hire or afford very much by way of polling and political consultants, but they were around me. And they did attempt, like my campaign manager, to dictate what I said and how I said it and what I said. But the problem here, again, are we destined and let me, let, me, let me describe this as a question. Are we destined to have a politics that is a politics of pandering? A politics of simply not leading people. You can't lead them. If you are basing your campaign on what people say they want, you can't lead them to where they are because they're already there. That is, it eviscerates the whole notion of leadership in politics because you basically are engaging in a kind of tautology. You are telling people you will give them exactly what they've told your pollster they want. Actually, Dick Morris, just to go off a little tiny tangent, in 1995, when he first came to the White House, it seemed to me and a few others that it was time for the administration to raise the minimum wage. And I couldn't get any support out of both the, the administration and also the Democrats in Congress, because they all said raising the minimum wage is old politics. It's just old politics, it's old democratic politics. Nobody's interested in that. And I went to Dick Morris and I said, Dick, why don't you do a poll? <laughs> you see, this can help you if you know how to do it. And Dick Morris came back the next morning and he said, he called me, he said, Bob, you won't believe it, 85% of Americans believe that minimum wage ought to be raised. I said, Dick, how did you find that out so fast? Are you polling your family? How do you do this? <laughs> but, but it helped, it helped because that poll uh, turned out to be very central in convincing the White House and also convincing Democrats and not a few Republicans uh, that we did need to raise the minimum wage. Now, let me take you back and rewind the tape. What I'm talking about here is not the difference between means and ends. There are a lot of politicians who compromise. I mean, uh, politics is the art of compromise, and every position of leadership in our society requires some degree of compromise to achieve certain ends. So what I'm, I'm not talking about, the inevitable compromises that are necessitated in achieving some goals. When I was 21 years old, I worked in Washington, uh, my first experience in Washington, for Robert F. Kennedy. Uh, and I was in charge of Robert Kennedy's signature machine <laughs> for the summer of 1967. And I, all summer long, put letters that had been written by his secretaries into the signature machine and watched this arm, long arm attached kind of to uh, his uh, uh, template of a signature, do Robert F. Kennedy. I finally got so bored doing that that late at night, after the secretaries had gone home, 
I would write up letters to my friends. <laughs> and they still exist. They are framed letters. Dear Mr. Dworkin, congratulations on having the largest nose in New York State. <laughs> Robert F. Kennedy. But during the course of the summer, and this is what I want to talk about is means and ends. During the course of that summer, I also, along with a, another fellow who worked for Jacob Javits, an intern for Jacob Javits, I worked for Robert F. Kennedy. We were the two interns from New York State. His name was Mark Green. He ran for, recently, for mayor of New York. Uh, but Mark Green and I organized interns all over the hill, Republicans and Democrats, against the war. We came out with a big petition against the Vietnam War. All of the interns, we actually got about 90% of the interns, and I was pretty proud of myself. It gave me something to do other than Robert F. Kennedy. Uh, I didn't sign Robert F. Kennedy to the petition, but I did. <laughs> I was tempted, but I didn't do it. But one day, now Robert F. Kennedy barely knew I was there, uh, and when you're a summer intern, you don't really expect much attention, but one day, I got word that he wanted to speak with me. And I was quite excited. I went and I waited in his anteroom. And finally, uh, they said, you ready to go in and see the senator? And I was ready. And I thought maybe he had heard about the petition and wanted to congratulate me. And I went in and I sat down. And he said, uh, Bob? Well, that was flattering enough. I said, yes, senator. He said, I understand you have been organizing a petition drive. And I said, yes, Senator. But I'm only co-chairman. I wanted to be modest about it. I didn't want to take all the credit. Uh, and he said, cease. <laughs> so excuse me, Senator. He said, stop it. I don't want you to do it. I just want you to stop, get out of this. I don't want your name associated with us. Do you hear me? And I said, but I, he said, I don't have time to talk about it, just stop. Thank you very much. And I was ushered out of his office. And I, I, I didn't understand because I had heard and I knew that he was against the Vietnam War. Uh, but I finally understood, because I talked to enough people in the office to understand, that this was an issue of means and ends. He was having enough trouble, said his assistant, with Lyndon Johnson at that time. He did not want simply more paranoia in the White House about what he might be up to on the Hill. He didn't need that. He had his own strategy. And I was just getting in the way. And so even though I felt very disillusioned, I at least understood that this was part of the means and distinction. This was not a politician without principle. It was just that I, thinking that I was actually contributing to his goal and certainly trying to contribute to my own sense of personal value, utilizing the position that he had created for me as being an intern, I thought that I was accomplishing a goal, but I didn't understand the larger framework. Now, I want to distinguish this condition, the means ends dilemma, from the Dick Morris dilemma, or paradox. Because when I talk about Dick Morris as opposed to Robert F. Kennedy, I'm talking about somebody and a set of advice that actually has no principle embedded in it. It is not a means-ends distinction. There is simply no, nothing there except the end of getting power, of getting elected for its own result. Now, I am about to say something I have no business saying at all. This is very presumptuous. I am from Massachusetts. You, many of you, are from California. But I've heard, people have told me, I don't know whether there's anything to this at all. You be the judge. I have heard that you're governor. <laughs> Let me put this in a slightly different way. People have told me that it's very difficult to figure out what the principles are that undergirds and motivates your governor other than achieving and maintaining power. I don't know whether that's true. You know better than I.
did somebody just talk about money? Uh, but I, but I, but I'm going to, I'm going to end this uh, really with enough time to talk to you or to answer any questions you have about this. But the point I want to make is, uh, it looks like, and, and and the conclusion that I would come to tentatively, if I were ending my discussion or my lecture at this point, would be uh, there is a great, great yearning in the public for politicians who have real principles, who are authentic in the sense that they stand up for what they believe. And even though I went around the state of Massachusetts basically saying pretty much what I believed and got into some trouble, I think, in fact, the polls showed that every time I did it, whether I talked about cardinal law or increasing taxes uh, on, on, on capital gains uh, or that gay marriage is a good idea, it turned out that when people did look at the polls, my polls increased every time. The, the popularity seemed to go up when I said things that were very controversial. Uh, on the, and uh, my conclusion, my tentative conclusion, was that because people actually are looking for, they want politicians that do, who do stand for something and who are willing to say what they believe. Now that, if that's where all I was going to say today, that would be simplistic. I want to make it more complicated. Because after I finished my campaign and looked back on it and thought about this issue of principles and uh, politics, thought about Dick Morris and the Dick Morris par paradox, it seemed to me that I was being a little bit overly simplistic, a little bit unsubtle in one very critical dimension. We have had politicians whether they are elected politicians or they're appointed politicians, whether they are politicians who try to be elected politicians, try in campaigns, we've had a lot of politicians who have very strong views. And some of those politicians we call ideologues. Now you choose your own ideologues. Some people would say Pat Buchanan, candidate for president. Some people might say Ralph Nader, candidate for president. Some people would say Ollie North, who's been a very, a, a kind of a noted public official and public servant in many ways. Whoever, whether you are on the left or the right, whoever you want, there is a category of people who you don't trust very much in terms of giving public authority to them. You don't trust them because they have a fixed set of ideas. You don't trust them because they have such certitude, certitude and, cert and such a, a, a sense of definitiveness about what the public wants and what they want and almost a grandiosity about their ability to understand what the public wants that you call them ideologues and don't trust that they can actually translate the public will into good public policy. Now, if that's true, if there are these people around and there, if there is this criticism abroad, then are we destined to make a choice implicitly or explicitly between, on the one hand, the Dick Morris type of politician, the principle-less politician, the politician who is basically out to gain and retain power, who has no principles, or on the other hand, the ideologue of the left or the right or whatever you want to describe that ideologue, who has such extraordinary grandiosity and kind of narcissistic insistence that they know what the public needs. And if those are not our two choices, what is the ideal that we would consider the right posture for a politician to have with regard to either politics and principle or the combination thereof. Now my answer, and it's a very tentative answer, after I thought long and hard about the issue, and, it, and, I, and, I, and I have to tell you, this is tentative. I'm not sure I am right. This is a work in progress. In fact, it's not even necessarily in progress. It's a work. I believe that there are politicians, and I will use some examples. John McCain would be one. The late Paul Wellstone would be another. Politicians who have the reputation of being principled po po politicians, but not necessarily ideologues. Now, what is the difference? 
Why is it that many of us, many of us, I'm not sure all of us, I'm not sure how you would empirically prove this, but many members of the public would say, John McCain, the late Paul Wellstone, these are politicians who are animated by strong conviction about what is right. There's something admirable about them. And yet they are not the kind of politicians who we would instinctively distrust because they have a grandiose sense that their opinion about what the public needs is better and more just or more correct than the public's vision of what it needs. What is there about a John McCain or a Paul Wellstone that leads us to judge them as principled politicians and not as ideologues? Well, my tentative conclusion is that these politicians exercise a certain kind of leadership. They approach the public with an, a set of ideals about what they think is correct, but they also respect the public enough to engage the public in a kind of dialogue about why they view those objectives as appropriate. If you actually watch John McCain, and Paul Wellstone was a very dear friend, and I spent a lot of time with him, watching him interact with voters. And you watch those two as examples, when they would say something to voters, I believe X, I believe Y, they would very often expose themselves in public gatherings, countless public gatherings, to questions from the public about why they felt the way they did. And they would argue their case in public, and occasionally, just occasionally, I saw it with both men, occasionally they would revise their views based upon what they heard from the public. In other words, they respected the public enough to engage the public in a deliberation about what was the nature of the public good. They had values, they had principles, they began that dialogue with a sense of why they were supporting certain positions. They were willing to argue their positions, but they understood that those positions could be revised and that the public needed to be educated at the very least about why they believed what they believed. And my point with you is that that is a different stance than either the Dick Morris principle less politician. Or on the other hand, the ideologue who has fixed views and is not willing to fully explain to the public or to engage the public in a deliberation about why he or she believes a particular view of the public good is better than another view of the public good. John McCain and Paul Wellstone also shared something else, which I think is part of the same posture of engaging the public in a dialogue, and that is a sense of humor. Never underestimate, in politics or in anything else for that matter, the importance of approaching a group of people, of being a leader, with a sense of humor. You're not taking yourself so seriously, you're taking issues very seriously but you're not taking yourself so seriously that you appear to the public or you appear to yourself as being filled with yourself. Paul Wellstone, John McCain, approaching politics with a certain humor but also a principled basis and a set of arguments about why they felt the way they did. Now, in my campaign in Massachusetts, whether we're talking about cardinal law or the income tax, or that is the capital gains tax or, or gay, gay rights, I did, I, without thinking very much, I didn't do quite enough of what, in retrospect, I think that John McCain or Paul Wellstone did do or would have done. If I were going to do it over, I would have engaged in more public debate. I would not have simply said whatever came to mind, I would, have, I would have couched my positions as this is what I believe. 
but I would have spent more time engaging various publics in a discussion about why I believed what I did believe. I did have to do that, but I did not, I did it kind of reluctantly. I don't think I, I, I approached the public as a leader or an educator. I tried to use humor because really I, I, that's the way I am, but I could have done a much better job. Which brings me to my final point. Whether you are running for office or in political office or whether you are simply a leader informally, using informal authority, a leader among your peers, it seems to me your responsibility and your effectiveness depends largely on your ability to get people to focus on a problem, a problem that they all have in common keep their attention focused on that problem and engage them in a deliberation about how best to approach and solve that problem. The essence, it seems to me, and again in a very tentative way, the essence of leadership is neither, neither simply standing there passively and saying whatever you want to do is fine, nor is it standing there grandi with, uh, in, in a very grandiose way and saying, this is what we are going to do. But it is rather a process of engaging a group of people around you, engaging their attention and engaging their energies and focusing their attention and focusing their problem-solving abilities on a problem that you help them identify, that you bring to them as not only a problem but some tentative solutions to the problem but you engage them in a deliberative process about how to solve that problem. You act in a principled way, you say this is what I believe but I am willing to be convinced otherwise. This is what we must do together. Many of you do this automatically. Those of you who are already leaders informally no matter what your rank, no matter what your status, no matter what your official capacity, already implicitly understand the model that I am advancing. And all I can say is, in this day and age, given the crises, the challenges, the tumult, the problems that confront all our institutions, Good luck to you. Thank you very much. And we have time for questions, uh, particularly about Michael Nacht and his background. <laughs> Uh, but actually, anything you would like to talk about, uh, be happy to. And why don't you just uh, tell me who you are uh, when I call on you, and then give me your question. I will repeat the question so everybody can hear. Yes. Uh, my name is Luke. I'm a first-year student at the Goldman School of Public Policy. And I'm very glad to be there. Um, <laughs> I had a question about the, what your impression is of the current uh, White House administration. Uh, it seemed that when they started out, there was a lot of Karl Rove <coughs> holstering, sort of like what you were talking about with Dick Morris. And perhaps now, post September 11th, it's sort of the reverse, more ideologue approach. What it, how does that? How do you view the current administration in terms of the framework you just laid out? Uh, well, I, I think uh, that Luke, you suggested in your question very much what my answer would be. I think Karl Rove uh, is very much of a Dick Morris character, but he's a Dick Morris character with some very strong ideological predispositions. In other words, he represents a sort of interesting combination of those two models. Uh, and I think Karl Rove has masterfully, masterfully, in the Dick Morris sense, uh, been able to manipulate a lot of public opinion around a lot of issues uh, that I think are, well, to take what, but one example. Uh, the notion that you are going to stimulate the economy by cutting taxes on dividends is one of the most absurd ideas I have ever heard. And that you can but that they can get away with that is awesome. <laughs> uh, 
now, having said that, that is, that is uh, but, but my point there is it's not just a matter of pandering to the public. Uh, there are some very strong ideological goals at work here, I believe. And again, you and I are working on the same database. I don't have any access, special access uh, that you don't have, and we may disagree about what we see as evidence for the following proposition. But my proposition is uh, this administration is highly ideological. It comes to, it comes to a power with a very strong set of ideological predispositions, one of which is supply-side economics writ very large. That is, make the rich even richer. But you hide it within a very, very elaborate, well-tuned, uh, well-oiled polling focus group operation which uses whatever pretext can be found to justify what it wants to do. In my view, the worst of all worlds. Very little genuine deliberation uh, with the public. Very little invitation implicitly uh, to the public to deliberate and very little real explanation to the public about why certain things are being done. Other questions? Yes? On the economy and unemployment, do you think that this administration should try to address the immediate effects of some sort of help for unemployment and short term or should they go for these tax cuts on the dividend? Well, the immediate problem the economy faces right now is overcapacity relative to demand. That's what's called in economic parlance a recession. And <laughs> those who say we are out of a recession or coming out of a recession are engaged in, I hope, uh, hopeful thinking uh, and not being absolutely wildly cockeyed optimists. Uh, but there is a lot of evidence that investors are holding back, consumers are beginning to hold back, and there are still factories that are operating at 75% capacity, a lot of underutilized machinery, and we have unemployment which is now at 6%, but you know as well as I do that 6% unemployment understates the actual percentage of unemployment because it doesn't count a lot of people who are too discouraged to be looking for work. So the number of people out there who are actually unemployed is probably up around eight, nine million and I would be surprised if by the next unemployment measure that comes out the first week of the month, first Friday of the month, we are not going to see an increase in unemployment. So what must be done right now is to stimulate the economy. Consumers are holding back, corporations are holding back, and to assume, and again, I want to stress this if I haven't stressed it enough, that the tax plan that the Bush administration has come up with that rewards the rich, not only with regard to a dividend tax cut, but also by accelerating the tax cuts that were already passed into law, which overwhelmingly are rewarding the rich, does not stimulate the economy. The rich already spend as much as they want. That is the definition of being rich. <laughs> uh, question is, I'm sorry, your name again? Rachel. Rachel's question is, how, given the discussion we have had so far, how does that apply to an appointee, a political appointee who is working at the behest and really has vicarious power uh, because you are appointed by somebody who has been elected? Uh, I served as Secretary of Labor. I had to do certain things and say certain things that I did not completely believe. And doesn't that put me and anybody in my position in a very awkward situation? Well, a couple of points. Number one, if you are an appointed official, uh, there is going to be a broad range of discretion you have that the person who appointed you is not particularly interested in. A president cannot deal in all of the minutiae of every single department. So that there was a whole range, like, for example, the work we did on sweatshops. The president just was not particularly, he wasn't opposed to it, but he wasn't particularly interested in it. There were other things that he was spending more time on, and therefore I had a lot of discretion to do what I believed in and also to try to sell the public on the importance of that. Now there were other issues such as welfare reform, quote unquote, where I had severe doubts and some of my colleagues in the administration did resign over it. Uh, the question for me 
was, is it, are my doubts so great that I could not bring myself on the media and in public forums to sell welfare reform because I didn't believe in it? Uh, well, it was a close call for me, to be completely candid with you, uh, but I felt in terms of means and ends, going back to the means and ends discussion we started with, that it was worth it for me to stay on and to try to avoid forums in which I had to defend welfare reform. It wasn't really directly under the Department of Labor uh, for the sake of other things that I thought were very important. Yes? Uh, my name is David Erickson. I'm a graduate student in the history department here. Um, I guess my question is, as I understand uh, Dick Morris's approach with I, triangulation, I think is his term, where he says, pick three or four of the issues that are going to get you elected, um, give that back to the public what they want, and then on the 20 or so other issues, follow your principles. And so I guess my question is, if he were here, could he, could, could, might, he might there be a category of the principle poster that takes that approach? Uh, the question is, uh, is there a category of a principal pollster that really is really a sub-genre of the means-ends kind of an assessment or, or, or person? Uh, where you say, look, you're going to use uh, public opinion to get you enough of a mandate, and you're going to maybe even pander to the public to get enough of a mandate to do things that you think are very important. Uh, I don't want to, again, I don't want to berate Dick Morris. I'm using him simply as an example here. I would say that most pollsters and most political consultants uh, are not assessing the world in exactly the way you suggested. Uh, I do draw a distinction and I do acknowledge that there is a means-ends approach. But even if you are separating means from ends, and even if you say, okay, I'm going to pander or respond to the public on these three or four issues following exactly what the polls tell me, uh, so that I can get enough mandate to do these other things. It's on these other things that you still, I would say, in a democratic system, have an obligation to explain to the public why you want to do them. If they're important to you, to simply substitute your judgment for the public and not engage the public in a reasoned discourse about why you think they're important undermines the democratic process. I don't know how much, how much time do we have? Five more hours. Five more hours. <laughs> We have a few more minutes. Let's let's say two more two more questions. Uh, yes, Matt. <coughs> Joyce, professor emeritus of public health. Um, you laid out clearly that we're not having the dialogue, and my question to you is: How do you explain, or why do you think the Democrats are so completely ineffective in having a dialogue, <laughs> either around the economy, or around the war, or around anything that could be of any importance? Uh, the question is, uh, why, and there is a, 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 a supposition built into the question. Uh, the question is, why are the Democrats so extraordinarily ineffective uh, in arguing any position? Uh, I, I, I think the answer there, uh, if we want to tar with a very, very broad brush. Uh, the answer there is, number one, uh, many Democrats, and we're talking about congressional Democrats, mostly these are the people who are in front of the public cameras on a regular basis. A lot of congressional Democrats, both in the House and the Senate, are intimidated by Bush's poll numbers. And they are especially intimidated by a president who is a commander in chief in a time of deep, deep public anxiety over what happened September 11, 2001. And so that intimidation spreads to all kinds of areas. Uh, and number two, I think it's fair to say uh, the Democrats ever since the time of Tony Coelho, anybody remember Tony Coelho? Again, I don't want to criticize but since the time of, at least since the time of Tony Coelho, Democrats have been feeding many of them at the same trough as the Republicans. And as money becomes more and more important, even with campaign finance reform, which was really a baby step in the right direction, as money becomes more and more important, there are more and more Democrats who, again, feel 
pressured, feel the intimidation, not so much of the president, but of people and institutions and companies that have a lot of money and don't want to rock the boat. And finally, Democrats are intimidated and cowed by the culture of pollsters and political consultants who are telling them over and over something that I don't believe, but they do. And what the political consultants are telling Democrats is 40% of the public is with you, 40% of the public is against you, and therefore your future depends on the swing voter in the middle. And therefore, you've got to moderate all of your views. Don't think about appealing to the base. Don't think about expressing yourself and your own values. Think instead about moderating your views to appeal to the suburban swing. My assumption, based upon what I have observed and what I observed firsthand, is that the public may not agree with you when you state exactly what you believe, but the public will respect you, and the public is yearning for an authentic politics. Politicians who really not only believe what they say and engage the public in a respectful dialogue about their beliefs, but also stand for something. Even if they may, the public may disagree with you. Paul Wellstone came out against going to war in Iraq, and his poll numbers increased, even though most people in Minnesota actually did not agree with him. Paul Wellstone would have won in Minnesota. And he would have won because people respected, just like they respect John McCain, they respected the way he undertook politics. Time for one more question. Yes. My name is Jessica, and I'm a first-year student at the Golden School of Public Policy. And my question is, if, as you propose, the public is hungry for principled leadership, then why aren't we getting it? And why are Bush's poll numbers so high? And how do you propose that we're going to get out of this situation? <laughs> um, okay, Jessica's question, good question to end on. Uh, is uh, if I'm correct on what the public uh, needs, and again, this is different from what the public loves. I, I, I'm not talking about lovability. I'm talking about uh, what the public needs and what the public would respect and respond well to, uh, and what our democratic system also needs. If I'm correct on it, why aren't we getting it, and what do we have to do to get it? Part of my response is the same response I gave before. That is, there is a set of, uh, there's kind of an intimidation going on. Uh, because of the poll numbers, because of the uh, terrorism, because of Karl Rove's skills, uh, because of money in politics, uh, because of the assumptions that political consultants are imposing on many politicians. Uh, I would like to think that enough evidence is accumulating that the public really is ready for a, let's call it a politics of authenticity, although that's probably an overused phrase, but you know what I mean after having discussed this for a while. I think the public is, there's enough evidence that I think we are going to see a change in our politics. Uh, Al Gore lost last time, and it is still amazing to me, although he got the popular vote, but he still lost. Uh, he, it is amazing to me that he managed to snatch defeat out of the jaws of victory, as he did, <laughs> And why is that, why, why did Al Gore lose? I think in part because he seemed like a fake. In those last three debates, the public kept on seeing somebody who was different. I think that memory shook up a lot of the political establishment, or that reality shook up the political establishment. And I think that the mere fact that you are beginning to see Again, John McCain's rating so high is being noticed in Washington and among the political establishment. So I, I don't want to be a Pollyanna about this, but I think that uh, in time, and it may come sooner rather than later, we are going to see politicians rewarded for this kind of what I am calling principled political leadership. And I hope those of you in this audience who have a chance, particularly those of you 
whose careers are in front of you, will not only exercise principled political leadership, but also at some point in your lives, run for office. Thank you.